Welcome, everybody, to Sticks and Sips, the Drew Estate Virtual Happy Hour. I'm Frank, Frankie Dranks Moreno. I'm super happy to be back with you guys another week. Great group of guests. And, uh, man, I, I'm super excited because I've got, like, this amazing sip and amazing stick uh, to present tonight. So, like I always ask you guys, check in from your neighborhoods if you haven't done so already. Love love seeing where everybody's coming from, man. And we've, you know, we've got the best of Pennsylvania, the best of Tennessee, and a little bit of best of Florida coming in uh, from uh, my man Joey uh, tonight, who's uh, who's in his secret lair. Uh, but like every week, we ask you guys as you're going through the show, hashtag Ask Frankie Drinks. You got a question? Uh, we pick your question. You guys going to get a little uh, little care package from us. So you're going to get this little Sticks and Sips cocktail kit. Uh, we're going to give you a beautiful Zycar cutter. Uh, we may send you a hat if Jack says it's good. So we may send you one of these or something else we got. And we'll send you a little bag of goodies. But tonight, I'm super excited because this is the Drew Estate Virtual Happy Hour and uh, what's a happy hour without a happy hour menu? So, uh, so tonight, uh, let's throw that that cocktail up, right? Our happy hour cocktail for tonight is the Gold Fashioned by AG, AJ Soldo uh, from Greenbrier, Greenbrier Distillery. And our special guests are Charlie Nelson from Greenbrier Distillery and my man Jim C. from Famous Smoke Shop. Plus, I've got a special guest. I got a little little alley action from Drew Estate. So uh, super excited. Uh, our stick is the Undercrown 10. If you haven't heard enough about the Undercrown 10, uh, where have you been? Because this is the most exciting thing we've got going right now, man. The most exciting stick we've released in a while. And I'm super excited to, to have you on. So I'm going to go on to the, to the Zoom lounge and just say hello to everybody. So I'm going to start with, uh, with our lady this evening, Allie. Uh, how are you doing? I'm wonderful. I, I, I'm, whew, I, I've had a couple of sips. I'm having a little bit of this. I'm having a good time. <laughs> Yeah, just uh, sips of what and whatever. We will get to that. Don't worry. We'll we'll get to it. But we're super happy to have you on with us again. I'm gonna go to my man Jim C. Uh, Jim, how you doing, brother? Doing well. Dodging raindrops. Uh, enjoying the Underground Ten. Uh, thankful to be uh, joining you guys. Appreciate it. Well, listen, I, I think you've got yourself, uh, you got enough supply there to to, to last about a, a good hour and a half. So uh, that's yeah, a good are. thing. That's a good thing. Uh, and next up, I got uh, one of my favorite people in the spirits industry, Charlie Nelson from Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery. Uh, Charlie, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. And, uh, you know, talking about whiskey and cigars, I, you know, what else, what better things do we have to talk about <laughs> and enjoy? So thank you. I'm glad to be Man. here. We are we are we are so psyched to hear everything, all the good stuff, and I'm I'm even gonna make a cocktail. But first, I gotta check in with my right hand man, uh, Joey oh. Drew, coming from Miscalandia. Uh, yeah. What's happening, brother? No, yeah, I had to uh, had to evacuate to my backyard lair. Uh, got a I got a back to backer. So after after sticks and sips tonight, I got a little thing going on with uh, cigar dojo. So uh, I'll be you'll see the de evolution of the wizard as I uh, smoke more cigars and drink more mezcal, as I go down the rabbit hole and I drag some people kicking and screaming with me. So cheers. Well, you know, we, we, uh, cheers to you, man. So uh, listen, uh, I need to get started. So, uh, so Jack, throw it on, man. I'm going to make the, the gold fashion by AJ Soldo. Um, really simple. We're starting, uh, you guys get the, the, the ingredients over there. I've got two ounces of Nelson's Greenbrier uh, Tennessee whiskey. Go two and a half. So, what? Go two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to stay true to the, to the recipe, you know, because AJ went through the trouble of, of going through this. And uh, what I'm going to add is a half ounce. Uh, I made, uh, it's, it's actually a quarter of ginger syrup and a quarter of honey syrup. Uh, I combine them both. And so we're going to do a little half ounce of uh, ginger honey because this stuff goes quick, man, because uh, you'll use it all over the place. 
and uh, we're going to do a little Angostura bitters and then uh, a little Peixotes. So uh, you get that in your mixing glass. And uh, Jack, you got the good cam on me or what? All right, so uh, so we get a little, little ice in there, you know, because we need a dilution. And like I told you guys, you know, uh, ice is key uh, to getting your cocktail just perfect. And, uh, you know, I like to go, you know, uh, certain person once told me you got to go 15 one way 15 the other and uh and you got to move you, you're going both you go both ways even than you're doing. yeah exactly you know you you you've, you've got to get the dilution going the right way so you know the last piece is you want to strain it out over a beautiful uh solid clear piece of ice and uh you get all those beautiful flavors uh, the only thing I'm missing is my orange rind because uh, my produce. What, the orange rind isn't beautiful too? Uh, it's not, you know, <laughs> not when you don't have it. Uh, but this is my gold fashioned. Uh, so I say cheers to everybody out there. And as I'm waiting for my autofocus to kick in, which uh, it's, oh, there, there we go, go, finally. So we get that beautiful, clear piece of ice. Uh, uh, Joey, I'm up to like four beautifuls, right? Uh, because yeah. this is a beautiful evening. Uh, and uh, and I say cheers to everybody. So raise your glass uh, and let's, uh, let's share a little toast. And a little sip. Man, that is delicious. Uh, Charlie, tell AJ, that's a great recipe, man fantastic so uh so look i'm gonna get to my first guest and he's the founder of nelson's greenbrier distillery with some other dude that may be his brother uh but he's gonna tell us all about that uh and and he's kind of done an, an amazing job of bringing a historical distillery back to life and uh and i'm not gonna say anymore uh with that let's welcome charlie nelson charlie welcome brother how you hey, doing? Thank you. I'm great. I'm great. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And hey, uh, I appreciate you making that that cocktail. Uh, I I enjoy it. It's it was actually uh, one of the first cocktails that we came up with for the the Greenbrier brand, um, and it it kind of pays a little bit of homage to um, to our story uh, because there's you know I'm sure you. I've told you, I think the story of, of my family coming over from Germany and, and the story of the gold, but I might as well tell everybody, right? Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't save it, man. Uh, people don't know what I know, but yeah, I, where, you know, where's this, the gold this, buried? This, tell us where that is. <laughs> yeah. Th this is the whole thing, man. This is the Megilla right here, right? You know, yeah. Uh, this I, is where you get your platform, brother. Cool. So, I, I mean, the, the, the story behind my company and the, the history of it really is the foundation of it. So um, I figure I'll, I'll tell you all the story and then talk a little bit about the whiskey and the bottle and everything. And um, but uh, yeah, it, it starts with my great, great, great grandfather, Charles Nelson. And that's that's my name, too. But uh, y'all can call me Charlie. Um, but uh, so Charles. The original, he was born on the 4th of July, uh, 1835, which I just love the fact he was born on the 4th of July, um, and but born in Germany. And his father owned a soap and candle factory and in 1850 decided he wanted to move his family to America. So sold the soap and candle factory and took all of the proceeds converted into gold, gold again, uh, and had special clothing made to hold all of the gold on his person. So he had gold sewn into his clothing, gathers up his family, his wife and six kids, and they boarded a ship named the Helena Sloman. Turns out from, I learned from the History Channel that the Helena Sloman was the first German steamship to make the transatlantic journey, brought over a bunch of famous Germans like Heinrich J. Heinz, Heinrich Steinweg, who started Steinway Pianos, of course, Charles Nelson, they didn't talk about Charles Nelson on this episode, though, but maybe if they remake it. But um, anyway, so while they're at sea, there are severe storms. The ship is damaged, taking on water for a couple of days, going down. And there's a nearby ship named the Devonshire who comes to rescue the passengers. And 
my family's on a little safety boat being ferried over to the Devonshire and it capsizes. The father with all of the gold on his person goes to the bottom of the Atlantic. So that's where, that's where the gold is. If, you know, I've, I've, my brother and I have talked, if, if, if the whiskey business doesn't work out, then we're taking scuba diving lessons. So, you know. Um, you know, this is a family show, Charlie. Uh, we're trying to keep it upbeat here. So, <laughs> so I hope the story continues going so forward. The story. See you later. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so luckily, the rest of the family makes it safely aboard the Devonshire, and they make it to New York, but with literally nothing but the clothes on their backs. Charles is 15 at the time. He's the oldest takes over his head of the family, does what he knows how to do, which is make soap and candles, does that for two years, moves to Cincinnati where there's a large German population, becomes a butcher there. And that's where he learns about the production of alcohol because the pigs that he's butchering are being fed by spent mash from a nearby distillery. So learns about the production, how to make whiskey. Then 1858 starts a wholesale grocery business in Nashville, downtown about a block away from where that crazy bombing was on Christmas day. I don't know if you remember hearing about that kind of weird. This story gets better and better. (laughs) Fortunately, the the structural integrity is still intact of the building. So we're good. Um, But um, at the wholesale grocery business, Charles had three great selling products, coffee, meat, and whiskey. See, it keeps getting better. Now Um, Now we're onto something. The coffee was supposedly delivered by a guy named Joel Cheek, who ended up taking that blend a few blocks away to the Maxwell House Hotel, became a pretty popular brand of coffee that's still kind of around today. And uh, the whiskey was, Charles was bottling the whiskey. He was one of the first to bottle and sell whiskey rather than selling it by the barrel or the jug realizes the demand far exceeds his supply, buys the distillery, expands it, and becomes one of the largest distilleries in the country, by far the largest in Tennessee. It was known as Old Number 5 because it was registered distillery number 5, which the federal government recognized and gave us an historic designation of DSP, Distilled Spirits Plant, TN, Tennessee 5. So if you look at the bottom of the bottle, actually, the, the punt of the bottle, you'll see um, the DSP-5 engraved on the bottom of the bottle. All right, so, so I'm going to try this. Uh, so we're, we're trying to get you know the camera to get that, and I think we might have a little bit of it right there. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, you know, shout out to, to Jack, uh, you know, who's got our great camera work going tonight. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, we've talked about this because there's something else that's like a number seven, but you're like a number five. So tell us about that. So, you know, I don't know about other people's business and brands. I know that our number five, um, you know, we have records of, uh, we have it framed in our distillery, um, a you know page straight out of a book of list of registered distilleries in the country, and it shows Charles Nelson registered distillery number five, and he produced the original Tennessee whiskey. Uh, we spent way too much time and money uh, researching to substantiate the claim that we are the original Tennessee whiskey than I would like to uh, admit, to be honest. But but we did it, and uh, both my, myself and we even hired a research agency to help out. So uh, we were, you know, this, what we're seeing is the original Tennessee whiskey. That's what really helped create a category for, or help create the category of Tennessee whiskey. And by the way, uh, just recently, uh, I believe of like, Last Friday was International Tennessee Whiskey Day, which uh, was a law that was passed by the Tennessee State Legislature just like a couple weeks ago or something. But so anyway, um, we'll take it. Yeah, <laughs> we'll take. Exactly. We'll, you know, listen. Any day we can celebrate any of 
of our endemic spirits will take it. So, uh, so salute to everybody out there uh, who has enjoyed Tennessee whiskey and more importantly has enjoyed, uh, you know, Nelson's Greenbrier Distilleries Tennessee whiskey, uh, which we can say at this moment with Charlie's permission, the original. Yeah, exactly. So, and so, okay. So it's the original known as old number five. Then it grew to become by far the largest and in Tennessee and one of the largest in the country. So by 1885, we were selling about 2 million bottles of this a year, which is crazy. Like, I don't know how many people were in the country at that time. There were about 40,000 in the state of Tennessee. And there's now like 6 million in the state of Tennessee. So, I mean, I don't know. There was a lot fewer people in the country, but we're we're not selling that many bottles today. But with with the help of everybody on here, I think that we can make a dent in there. You know? Yeah. Well, li li listen. With with COVID, everyone's drinking a little bit more, and uh, you know, I'm going to advocate uh, start drinking right. You know, uh, m you know, Joey and me more Joey than anyone else. Uh, we've made an enormous dent in cigar smokers drinking mezcal. So I think we can make the same dent in people coming back to some Tennessee whiskey, especially the original, yeah. because you guys are going to come back into something beautiful because this is uh, a really not only a great story uh, coming out of meat, coffee and whiskey, uh, because, you know, meat, coffee and whiskey. Uh, really, what else do you need to survive? Drowning. Uh, if you could survive drowning, that would have been. Bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't even need the gold anymore, man. We just need meat. We need coffee, and we need whiskey. Uh, so, so Charlie, please keep going, man, because this. Uh, I know we're only like halfway through the story. Yeah. So it's it's a long one, and I'm 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 leaving some details out too, believe it or not, but. Um, so Charles passes away in 1891, uh, and that's why our Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey is 91 proof. So everything we do, we try and have a reason behind it. But um, And also, uh, prior to Prohibition, he had about 30 different labels. So um, he also produced Bell Mead, which is one of the brands that we produce. Um, you know, he did that in conjunction with another company, the Sperry Wade and Company. Uh, he aged and bottled it, whereas the Bellmead distillery owned by the Sperry Waden company distilled Bellmead. And so that's why we came out with that brand first. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but uh, anyway, so he passed away 1891. That's when his wife Louisa takes over as one of the only women to run a distillery back in the day, uh, which is something that we're incredibly proud of. Uh, we named our still Miss Louisa after her. Um, we have a mural of her painted in the uh, production area, and we have um, an award that we do every year called the Louisa Nelson Awards, where uh, three women in the Middle Tennessee area win, and we make, uh, they're making a difference in the community, and we make a donation to charities of their choosing in their name. So we're very proud of Louisa. Uh, she ran the business until 1909 when statewide prohibition hit Tennessee, forcing us to close our doors. And, uh, and growing up, I didn't know about the distillery. Honestly, I just knew the story of my family coming over from Germany and the gold and everything like that. But I didn't even fully believe that story. Uh, not until at least several years ago when uh, we found actual records of it from the New York Herald from 1850, talking about the journey over and the gold and We've since found a few other records too. So it turns out it's actually true. But um, anyway, so in 2006, my dad went in with three of his buddies to buy a cow worth of meat from a butcher. And, uh, you know, he invited me. <laughs> yeah, yo, 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 wait, we, we need to stop right here. Well, All right. So, so yeah, so, uh, <laughs> you know, because because uh, Ali's throwing me off on the side Zoom, uh, you know. All right, so uh, listen. I do. You know, you and Jim. Uh, so all right, so we need a little reset. Okay, so um, all right, 
three guys go in on a cow. This is like this is like a religious joke. Uh, Charlie, well, there's four. There's take four. Take us home, my man. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, actually, a, a funny. I side note. Uh, I went on a, a bachelor trip, bachelor party trip. Uh, met some friends in Cleveland, Ohio, to go to baseball games. Um, and I was, we were driving to from Cleveland to Pittsburgh, and uh, it was the the bachelor and his two brothers and me. And he's like an organic farmer. One of his brothers is a preacher, and the other one's an F. FBI agent and I was like I'm living a joke right now <laughs> the organic farmer a, a preacher and an FBI agent drive from Cleveland to Pittsburgh what happens anyway it was you gotta tell us man so listen <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna we're gonna go back three dudes go in on a cow yeah uh right yes yeah yeah so uh let's three do dudes this and my dad and my dad. Uh, okay, so, three dudes in it, and your dad. Yeah, and so my dad invites me and my brother to go with him to pick up our quarter of a cow. So we're on our way to this butcher. We're running low on fuel. We stop to fill up, and at the gas station, there's this historical marker that says Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery, one mile east on Long Branch Road. Charles Nelson opened the Greenbrier Distillery. We're like, holy shit, what is this? We go on to the butcher. He happens to live a mile east. We ask him if he knows anything about the old distillery. He's like, well, hell, look across the street. So we do see this old barrel warehouse still standing, the original spring still running, drank from the spring. And then he sends us to a nearby historical society where there were two original bottles just like this with my name on them. Just about every hair on my body stands up. My brother and I look at each other. We're just like, man, this is what we're here to do in life. So we've been working on resurrecting the company ever since. And that was 15 years ago. And, um, you know, we had, so in order to get started, nobody would invest in us to, to build our distillery and everything. So in order to get started, my family and I, we put up literally everything that we owned to personally guarantee a loan to get started sourcing barrels, working with a contract distillery to produce Bell Mead bourbon, which was initially meant to be like a bridge to get us to building our distillery and getting to Greenbrier. So then we were able to, you know, we came out with Bell Mead in 2012, raised some money, built out our own distillery, opened it in 2014, started laying down barrels of Greenbrier in 2014. And then we released it about a year ago um and then the world shut down so it only taken us like 13 years to get to the starting line and then uh you know now now we're um kind of trying to relaunch a little bit we just launched in nashville and now we're we're launching in a, a handful of other new markets now so so listen I, i'm gonna i'm gonna show off here as soon as it focuses our bell mead bourbon because this is how I met you um, with this beautiful product that, that you guys brought in that you had historically produced. And uh, man, one of my favorite bourbons. Um, and there's a story with the two horses. Uh, if you want to skip that, we will. Uh, but it, it was part of your story, man, because your story is rich, brother. Your story is rich. Yeah, so, so much. So, um, you know, Bell Mead, uh, like I mentioned, was produced in conjunction with another company. And everything that we do, we try and keep in line with the history of the original. Um, but uh, so, you know, we, um, the, the we're using like the original label from over a hundred years ago. And the horses on the label were studs at the Bell Mead Thoroughbred Farm which back in the day was one of the nation's leading thoroughbred farms. And uh, so the horse on the right-hand side of the label was named Bonnie Scotland, who was like the founder of the Northern Dancer bloodline that includes like War Admiral, Seabiscuit, Secretariat, California Chrome, American Pharaoh. 
I mean, pretty much all the horses that even race in today's Derby can trace their bloodline back to Bonnie Scotland. Um, and then the, the original label um, had the names of the horses on it written above them, but we decided to take the names off of the label because the one on the left was named Brown Dick. So we... Oh. All right. So uh, as we continue, thank it's you, Jim. Like, uh, like a five-part miniseries right here. Right here. Uh, right exactly. here. Uh, listen, we're, we're, uh, we're trying to condense the entirety of Better Call Saul into one episode. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, guys, uh, but more importantly is this is how you come into the market through, through Bell Mead. And in the meantime, you guys are distilling Nelson's Greenbrier uh, Tennessee whiskey. Uh, or sour mash whiskey, right? Um, and also in something that a lot of people don't know is what really makes it Tennessee whiskey and not bourbon. And I think that's a key point because uh, a lot of people that have had a very popular brand uh, with initials JD and it says number seven on it, you guys can kind of piece it together, right? Uh, and JD is not Jonathan Drew. It's an, it's another guy it starts with Jack and ends with whatever. So, and that's what, you know, as Tennessee whiskey, but as it's essence is truly, in my opinion, bourbon, except for one small uh, production part. So uh, Charlie, like guide us through what really is Tennessee whiskey, brother. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'll, I'll take a step back and say, all right, bourbon, you know, bourbon has to be number one, made in the U.S., number two, made from at least 51% corn, and number three, aged in new oak barrels that are charred on the inside. Tennessee whiskey has to be all three of those things, plus it has to be made in Tennessee, plus it has to be filtered through sugar maple charcoal. So basically just charcoal that's made from a sugar maple tree. And, you know, our, our charcoal mellowing tank is basically like a giant Brita filter. It's a barrel packed full of charcoal from sugar maple trees. And Charles Nelson, my triple great grandfather, was quoted as saying that the charcoal mellowing process removes some of the heated elements that cause an unpleasant farewell However, the aftermath of all whiskeys is unpleasant if consumed in too large of a quantity, which I thought was a nice way to talk about a hangover, you know? Nice. I, I, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so for everybody that, that you know, um, the charcoal filtering is happening uh, before it goes into the barrel. Is that correct, Charlie? Yes, yeah. But there, there's, there's no, there's a law saying that it has to be charcoal mellowed before bottling it doesn't say that it has to be done before uh like whether it's before or after barreling like you could we do it before barreling and i think everybody else does but just as a point of technicality i think that you technically can do it before or i don't know of anybody that actually i think the gentleman jack maybe does it before and after um gotcha yeah, but you know before and after the barrel yeah. Before and after. So uh, listen. <laughs> but we and, do it just before the barrel. So uh, you know, listen, Charlie. Uh, what an amazing, uh, not only family story about uh, about Nelsons and and about you. Uh, you you kind of mentioned your brother, like you know, sparingly. Uh, but I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, you know, so after all this, how did you know? What were you doing before, and how did you? you say, this is what I want to do? So, I mean, first of all, I love my brother and uh, he's my partner and uh, he just had a baby about a month ago. And so I'm an uncle uh, for the first time, which I'm excited about. And uh, uh, Andy is my brother and, and he's like the head of production and operations where I'm more the head of sales and marketing. What I my last full time job before this was kind of uh, kind of random. Um, I, like before that, I, I did 
I was, was like a, you know, I started off washing dishes. I was a, you know, bus boy, bar, you know, server, bartender, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I, I traveled a lot. Um, I, I traveled around like Europe and Southeast Asia. I love languages and cultures. And then I randomly got into this thing. The last full-time job I had was uh, helping teach uh, through a software program, Iraqi Arabic language and culture to soldiers before going to Iraq. And so uh, that it actually came in handy earlier today. I was on like a little sales call and the buyer spoke Arabic. And so um, I started speaking Arabic with him. And then there were actually two guys there. The the spirits buyer spoke Arabic and the wine buyer spoke is from France. And I, I bartended in Paris for a little while. So I I got to speak a little French and, and Arabic with them. It was kind of fun. I, I was going to go with like, you could have shortened it down to like vagabond, but yeah. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have done it any justice at all. I think gypsy is a better term. Yeah. <laughs> the man bartended in Paris, you know, respect. Uh, so. <laughs> Cheers to that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It was, it was during, I made a lot of mojitos and uh, a lot of Cosmos at the time and poured a lot of like Kears and and pastis. And um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. You yeah. want to drop the name or, you know, do we have to fly to Paris to find out? I mean, it was, it was just like a little bar called the steeple bar. Um, I've got, I mean, I could probably go on for hours about stories about it. Um, one thing that was gosh, i really want to know what the name of your podcast is so i can listen i, I need to do a podcast i think you do uh, <laughs> charlie I, you, I you actually, and me can do a podcast uh you know we, we'll invite jim every now and then and and ali will always be our color commentator uh because uh you know she's gonna have all the geeky shit that you want to talk about so i i, I love i love all the uh, all the reactions from everybody is uh, dude uh i've got to look at this camera but i've got the reactions over here yeah. so it's it's really hard yeah. <laughs> i keep myself on mute honestly because my face is really loud so i apologize if you want me your, to the video your face is really loud my face is really loud i love it loud face <laughs> ali loud face crozier there you go there there you go uh, you know, so uh, listen, we're going to go back to Charlie. He's bartending in Paris. Uh, why'd you, why'd you fucking come back? <laughs> so I, I, um, I studied abroad in uh, Paris for a semester. And then I just took time off and I was traveling around Europe and then Southeast Asia. And, and I was talking to my dad uh, and he was like, what are you doing? come back home or something and i was like i don't he was like come back and finish school really is what he was saying and uh i was like i don't need to like i'm learning so much more in the real world than i ever learned in these stupid books like practical knowledge is so much better than theoretical knowledge like what what is this and then ultimately long story short after a bunch of different arguments he convinced me ultimately that um, having, you know, the combination of the theoretical and the practical combined is a more powerful thing than anything else. And I was like, all right, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I have one semester left. So I finished and I, I, I went back uh, to school and I uh, wrote a grant, uh, I wrote a paper to apply for a grant and um, I won it. It was uh, the Eugene Escalier grant, and I proposed to study um, Paleolithic cave paintings in Spain, Italy, and France. Of course you did. Of <laughs> course you did. I'm, yo, I, I'm leaving right now. <laughs> I mean, my God. So, I mean, we've so, had some interesting people on this show, but you are now it. Yeah, I brother. Blow everybody out of the water with what and you I knew, and I knew what was gonna happen because he is the most fascinating man 
uh, you know, if you weren't with with Nelson's Greenbrier, you would most definitely be with Dos Equis, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Real. So, so what's crazy is actually that the, the grant comp plays into the whole story a little bit because, um, so the grant was for $2,000 and for two months in Europe. And that's why I went back to Nashville because I was in school in California in Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University. And um, <laughs> hey, hey, listen, that's where my son goes. Really? <laughs> yes, he's a he's a sophomore right now. He's going to be a junior. He's at Loyola Marymount. My man, <laughs> so you are a lion. That is crazy. Yeah, go lions. <laughs> yeah, um, that's awesome. Dude, we'll we'll talk about this offline. But uh, yes, please continue, my man. Yeah. Oh, let's, uh, look, look, we. Uh... Oh yeah, he could he couldn't let somebody else be like the most interesting person on the earth. He had to <laughs> he had to jump in and be like, wait a second, wait. So, uh, I have the unique honor, Charlie, to interrupt you in your beautiful journey uh, with Nelson's Greenbrier to introduce the founder of Drew Estate, uh, my man, uh, Jonathan Drew, uh, coming in from uh, some places in the Northeast. I love your booze. Let me tell you, no bullshit. I jumped onto this call. I have loved your products for a very long time. Hell yeah. So, you know, uh, it's great to see that you've joined the family here. And uh, I just wanted to say hello to everybody, Charlie and Allie and Jim and our man, Joey Drew, Frankie Dranks. Hey, great to see you guys. I didn't mean to interrupt. Just wanted to join for a few minutes. And, and no, no, stay, stay on, man, because we got you. some great stuff coming from Charlie because he's wrapping up. He's got a major grant from uh, Loyola Marymount, which is where my son goes. And he's going to study cave paintings in France and in Spain. And uh, now we're going to get to the big jump, man. This is this is Fonzie, you know, jumping, you know, into uh, the nether worlds of spirits. So, Charlie, take it away, brother. Yeah, well, before I do, thank you so much because I, I I love your products too, man. Thank you uh, for doing what you do, um, making it do what it do. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so get this grant, $2,000 for two months in Spain. The plane ticket alone is like a thousand bucks. So I'm like, shit, a thousand dollars to last me two months in Spain, Italy, and France. That's not going to get me there. So that's, I went back to Nashville to do some work to try and make some money to be able to have a good time. And while I'm in Nashville working to make money for my trip, that's when my dad went in with the three buddies to buy the cow worth the meat from the butcher and invites. And so while I was, while I was in Italy in a place like, so, so we, we discover this you know, I go back to, as you know, we discover my family's history, the distillery, the bottles with my name on, decide this is what we're going to do. And I was like, well, I'm still going on this trip. Um, and I'm in like this tiny town, Capo di Ponte, Italy, and meet this guy, Emmanuel Anati, who's like the world's foremost scholar on Paleolithic cave paintings. And he like invited me to study under him. I was like, ah, man, I sounds interesting, but I gotta do this whiskey business. <laughs> and so I then I I took my last semester of of college. I took my first and only business class. I wrote a business plan, moved back to Nashville as soon as I graduated and started working on it. Well, you know, that's that's uh, Ali. Uh, I'm gonna let you wrap it up for me because, uh, yeah, absolutely, Ali, wrap it up for us because we've heard so much, dude. That was when you described it earlier. I was like, that must be what it's like when people are called to the priesthood. Like, you had a call, <laughs> it was a full body experience. You're like, this the, the heavens opened up, angels sang, and you knew. I love that. 
Do, uh, it so I, I like the way that you just describe it because that that really is like when when I when I saw those two bottles, it it was it, it was completely an out of body experience. It was like the only moment of clarity in my life. And you know, I, I mentioned that I have traveled a fair amount, but like in that moment, like my life kind of flashed before my eyes. And I I saw, like I was just telling someone this earlier today. I saw I I saw myself in a bar in Japan in that moment. I was in Greenbrier, Tennessee, in the Greenbrier Historical Society, but and I've never been to Japan. I still haven't been, but like well, that's one place <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah it was, it was crazy unreal well listen uh you know by far charlie you have taken us on the most convoluted road uh for a whiskey company and uh and i celebrate you for this because uh you know i'm privy to knowing a little bit of that story uh, by having you, uh, by knowing you before and the story of Bell Mead and the story of uh, Nelson's Green Briar, uh, Tennessee whiskey. And, uh, and I hope everyone out there has, has gotten the gist of it. And, uh, you know, what can I say, man? Uh, you know, four dudes and a cow, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a guy that, that drowns laden in gold uh man uh the history is rich you got a horse named brown dick uh come on man uh it, it's uh it's amazing here <laughs> joey yeah. save me bro yeah no uh, you know what you know what yeah, you have to go around the world to come back home you know and that's really that's the story of this it's like you know you found it all home and that that really makes it special that's i it's true and so like when I when I was growing up, I I was like, you know, I've got a big family and from Nashville and stuff. And um, growing up, I was like, I just I got to get out of here. And that's part of the reason why I went to California for school. And when I would when I would fly out of Nashville, I would I had like, you know, my what the CD player or maybe a Walkman or something playing Eleven Spoonful uh, album. And there was a song on there that was like, never going back. No, I'm never going back to Nashville anymore. And I was like, I'm never going back, man. And, but then, you know, this yeah. brought me back. Yeah, somebody yeah. else had a different uh, idea for you. Yeah. You know, I hear you. And uh, this this emulates a lot of, of, the roots and history of, of you. And I celebrate you. And I want to say thank you for being on Sticks and Sips. Uh, listen, uh, we're not going away from you, but right now uh, I'm going to ask my man, because he's been on a similar journey and he's a founder of Drew Estate. And uh, JD, my man, uh, you know, welcome back to Sticks and Sips, your home. And, uh, you know, when you hear Charlie's stories, man, about, about leaving the comforts of home and going uh, to the unknown and finding yourself and finding your your purpose, man. I mean, I know that's got to resonate with you. Yeah, it definitely resonates with me. And and you know, we talk about that a lot about our our, our roots and and our inspirations and stuff. But the, you know, the <clears throat> when Jack told me and and I'm still learning the new name I still look at it as as Bell Mead and I and I have to get the it is newly name change the name changes happened or is there no new name change or, or so no, what, what we've got is Bell Mead bourbon which was their first offering when when they came into business and now um they're not only offering Bell Mead as well uh but the so the, there's no name Nelson's change right no, we've just offered Thanks something else. God. We're offering All the right, truth good. here, bro. We're offering the truth. I got to tell you something. This is what I was trying to say is that's why I got mixed up because the Bell Mead, the first time I had that was at Burns Tobacconist, all right, which was, I would say, 10 years ago, eight years ago. I can't remember how long it was. More, maybe. I don't know. And, man, you know, 
Frank knows and Joey knows the type of bourbon and the type of whiskey, uh, not just bourbon, but American whiskeys that I like. And you, your, your, your juice is really good, man. Let me tell you, um, my couple favorites that are out there. I mean, people know, you know, I, I like Angel's Envy, some of the products that they make, the cask strength. I like all their products, but I also like the, uh, the Widow Jane and your Bell Mead and the Hudson. Those are some of my absolute favorites. And um, I've had a number of your products throughout the years and I've bought it many times. And uh, just like I'm a fanboy so of, of your work. And uh, when I heard you here, so I don't want to repeat myself, but what a great, there's so much smoke and mirrors and so much stuff out there on the market that's not just in the booze category, but in any category that, uh, you know, there's a lot of hype, but the product doesn't live up to the name or to the hype. And your products are really, really good. And I know that we have such a big viewership, uh, Frank and Joey and, and the, the, the team tonight is that we have special guests on, but you know, they've built such a big viewership and so many people watch us that, and, and what we're talking about. And, and, you know, I just want to say as a testimonial on a personal level, you know, thank you for, for creating such great products and keeping them consistently really good. Um, you know, this is a tough crowd right here. Allie's really tough too. Forget it. She's a whole nother, uh, uh, level of tough, but, uh, you know, so, so that, that's all I'll do. Just, just, I'm here actually in Sag Harbor and, um, I just got here actually came back for the, for the, the season or whatever. I don't know when I'll be back, but, um, I am going to hit the liquor store, uh, before the weekend, because they have special guests coming out. And the first bottle I'm going to grab is going to be one of yours for sure. I promise you that. I'll even report back with a picture. So oh, thanks yeah. for being our special guest. Well, and, uh, I'm going to tell you this, JD. If you can if you can get the Bell Mead and the Sherry Cask, that shit's money. The Sherry money. Cask? Sherry so Cask. <laughs> that, that might be, that might be a little tough. To get the the sherry cask and the, the all the cask finishes are now like uh, distillery only. There's still some out there on the market, but but you can find Bell Mead and Bell Mead Reserve in now all or 49 states. Just can't find Utah. Um, Jim's giving us the uh, the play by play. Actually, he's got all of them. Yeah, I've got them all sitting right here. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> listen, the sherry by the way, cask. we we got it. We got to get together and you know have a have a glass of whiskey and smoke a cigar together or something at some point, man. You don't don't threaten me like don't threaten like don't threaten us like that again, because uh, we'll take it serious. Uh, so listen, I'm gonna go to my man. Uh, you know he is. Uh, from famous cigar shop in, in uh, Easton, PA. Not only is he a whiskey uh, aficionado, man, but he is probably the premier person that knows cigars. And tonight he's smoking Undercrown 10. So what a great honor for me to welcome Jim Charnelli. Thanks, Frank. Or Charnley, or Jimmy C, Jimmy C. whatever it is. Yep. I got For you, years, my brother. It's been everything. Chumley, Chainley, Chinarly. I've heard it all. They all work. Jim C is the easiest. <laughs> well, thanks for having us on tonight. And appreciate being here. And um, Dude, Charlie, uh, I, I love your, your stuff. I, my my uh, last pre-COVID uh, trip was to Nashville uh, with my wife for our 15th wedding anniversary. And uh, our last stop on February 15th was to your distillery where I picked up this bottle I opened last night to, to start the process of tonight uh, off on the right foot. So uh, you guys have a, a great story and a, a great location uh, in Nashville. It's, it's just, it's a really cool area with the motors across the street and, you know, coffee shops and art studios. It's, it's this great revitalization of that area of Nashville. So keep doing what Jim, doing. how big is that bottle? It looks like it's a freaking Magnum. Well, no. So this is this is your, your normal uh, 750. And then there are a couple of things I picked up at the distillery, like the uh, Nelson's 108. I don't know if you can see that, but um, that up a little there. more. Let's see that one. Whoa. So I think this is distillery only, if I if I'm correct. 
Um, yeah, that's 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 it's gone. It was there were only 108 uh, barrels of it, and we sold out of it about I don't know a year ago or something. Yeah, so I mean, I may have flown to Nashville with a suitcase full of clothes, but I flew home with a suitcase full of bottles. Just <laughs> you know, because you know, Solid. some some states like ours, we can't get anything. Um, and then you know, this is really good too, uh, Jonathan. I'll get you a pour if you can't find it. Um, yes, yeah, send over uh, the bottles here. Okay, um, no problem. I'll drop them off on my way to New Hampshire this weekend. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Um, but actually, I got this through one of the barrel clubs I'm part of because I, I I love cigars and I love whiskey. And in fact, whiskey is why I started smoking cigars. I was at a wedding about ten years ago. It was our first night away from our daughter after she was born, and I got very um, uh, happy on Tennessee whiskey and uh somebody said let's go smoke cigars and I'd never I'd never smoked a cigar in my life my dad did growing up he smoked cigars and pipes and um w walked outside the the hotel the reception was at somebody handed me a cigar I to this day have no idea what it was I'm surprised I remember I had a cigar and um that was it next day I walked down the street and I bought uh my first purchase was a the tin set uh, sampler of uh, acid cigars. And that was 10 years ago. Um, that was my entry into the industry. I, at the time was selling uh, employee benefits insurance, group insurance, which was um, way less interesting than the cigar industry. Um, <laughs> and uh, Arthur, who Arthur Zaretsky owns Family Smoke Shop, uh, Famous Smoke Shop, it's a family owned company. We're celebrating our 82nd year this year. Uh, started in, in 1939. Um, and he, I was in having a, a drink at our, our cigar bar and, uh, one day and he came over and he goes, what do you want to do? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, come work for famous. So, um, the company I worked for was just sold to a bank and we were all being downsized. It was perfect opportunity. Um, I spent about 10 years pairing cigars and bourbon. Um, the, the undercrown 10 is just spectacular. Um, we got a little sample kit of it from the, our, our, our friends at Drew Estate. Um, and I was really excited uh, when, when Frankie and Jack picked it for tonight because it's, it's uh, as much as I love the regular Undercrown and I love the story of it starting with the, the rollers on the floor of the factory and how this was kind of their kind of organic brand that came to market and is such a great cigar. This takes it up to a whole different level. Um, you got this great right off the bat spiciness and sweetness from the San Andreas wrapper and the, the binder, uh, the Connecticut Broadleaf binder. It, it just, it's an amped up version. It's smooth, it's silky, it's fantastic. Uh, and it does pair really great with the uh, Greenbrier. Um, I would also say it pairs pretty well with the, the 108 if you can find it or the reserve as well. Um, uh, well, I well, I'm find, finding find the nice strong. I'm finding the Bell Mead is is a money pairing as well. Uh, fantastic. So the, the reserve, yeah. That was actually my first bottle of Bell Mead. Uh, one of the one of the people on my team had gone to Nashville uh, a year or so, year and a half before I went, and uh, she was in the airport and said, "You know, here's a picture of everything they have. What do you want me to bring back for you?" Uh, so I, I PayPal'd her some money, and she brought the, the original cast strength bottle I had back. So. Uh, that was my first uh, exploration into Belmede. Um, but for those of you out there, if you get a chance to go to Nashville, you know, a lot of people go to this place a little south of Nashville, but you're, you're missing the true gem if you don't go over to uh, to see the, the Green Briar distillery over there. Right. Uh, I'm going to ask my man, uh, Jack, right now to uh, to throw up that beautiful slide of the of under content. You know, so we're talking about... Uh, uh, Mexican San Andreas wrapper, uh, Connecticut River Valley, uh, you know, binder, Nicaraguan filler. And in that taste profile, you know, I'm going to call my man Joey in on this because uh, such a key feature, you know, and, and uh, you guys getting that, that, that beautiful money shot of, uh, of our packaging because this is one of the most beautiful things we've produced uh, and we produce some beautiful things, man. Uh, but this one's sexy as AF. So yeah, all the way down to the, the, the gold ribbon across the top of it is just the greatest finishing touch to that cigar. That's the all decked out part. That's the, you know what, you can, you can rock jeans and a t-shirt or a 
you know, a little flannel or something, you know, all the time. But sometimes you got to dress up. Sometimes you, you know, you're going out on a date and you want to spiff up a little bit. You don't want to put on a tie necessarily, but you want to put on a nice shirt, you know, spray a little cologne. And then that's, that's getting all decked out. But it's a Mountie cigar. What other, what other sizes have you smoked in the line? I know you probably got the Toro fired up. Yeah, so I did the Toro. That was my first, uh, the first one I had from the, the little sampler pack that everybody sent out for, for the team. Um, I, I had the Robusto as well. I actually smoked one Robusto and then yeah, after the through Charlie's stories five. went to the second yeah. one. Yeah, that's my um, favorite size so far. Is the, the Robusto is just, it's just a fire stick. It's great. And to answer uh, Frankie's question from earlier, Mexican hot chocolate, that was the first words that popped into my mouth when Willie handed me some samples, you know, almost shit almost a year ago and it was just like as soon as i said it i was like oh my god yes you know i'm it's all got that about nice kind of Hill. all about oh. the Raptor Hill. dude it is so polite oh I, it's oh it's polite <laughs> so polite so i i like to retro hail pretty much every cigar in all thirds of it just to get an yeah. idea and the whole time it's just so polite and it's almost sweet as yep. you retro hail for those of you listening just try it if you don't know how to do it talk to your tobacconist they'll help you out <laughs> Damn. Yeah, really are, are, are they are, are they really going to help you out ali you know are they really going to help you retro hail uh can you you know could you walk us through the process if if you will I, I was going to say, Jim and all the fine people at Famous Smoke Shop all know how to do. I'm just going to do back in there, being that I, I, those are some of my origins. For those of you who do know me, I worked with Jim at Famous Smoke Shop before I got picked up uh, for the road. I'll put it that way. Um, yeah, yes, a good tobacconist will teach you how to retrohale. I, I describe it it's so much easier in person because I can actually make the audible sound of air blowing out of your nose because people don't get it. They think they have to bring it into their lungs. Then they choke and I laugh at yes. them. <laughs> that is what you do. You're like, Laughing is a key step to teaching somebody how to retrohale. It's, it's, it's the payment for teaching them really. And then the grand scheme of things. Exactly. So bring the smoke into your mouth and exhaling the smoke out of your nose. So you don't bring it into your lungs at any point when you're smoking a cigar or else I was talking to somebody that's a complete novice and they're like, yeah, somebody handed me a cigar and I, I got sick. I'm like, did you inhale? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, you, they didn't tell you not to. So don't inhale it into your lungs. You bring the smoke into your mouth as you normally would, but you exhale out of your nose. And I would not suggest the first time exhaling the full puff maybe puff some of it out first through your mouth and then the rest of it, almost like a, oh, there's a word I'm looking for. Just that remainder, blow it through your nose and just get an idea. Right. Uh, Cause Frankie and I have talked about this many a time and he's given, you'll have to check out that video on my feed. Uh, he gave a master class on your olfactory senses and why it works and why it's important to retrohale if you are capable. Right, if you are capable at the end of the day, it's about, um, you have taste buds, not only on your tongue, you have them on your gums, you have them under your tongue, you have them on the sides of your mouth, and you actually have them in the back of uh, what's, called, what's called your nasal cavity. Um, and you're actually able, um, the same way that you're able to inhale something and, um, and grab the flavor when you, uh, inhale that is because you have taste buds that are in your sinuses, um, whether you want to get that scientific or not. But the idea is that that you get no, no, no. Hang on, hang on. You can't go because I want to say, uh, my man JD, uh, tell us about the importance of Underground Ten, man. If you, just one minute, man. And I gotta go. Well, Thank you. I love you guys. Charlie, right, thank Charlie. you so much, brother. Please, don't you, doesn't Charlie want to hear about the importance of underground? I do, I do. I mean, listen, I, <laughs> I'm just going to be off screen. So, no, you're free to back. go, homeboy. I was just playing. You make good whiskey, so you're always free to come and go as you want. Send bottles. So, great guest. That was cool, Frank and Joey. So, so, um, I'll tell you this, Undercrown 10 is the only Drew Estate brand with three 
slogans. Born on the factory floor, all decked out, and decade of dedication. There's Joey's got it right there. And um, that says a lot because three, there used to be an ad when I first got into the cigar industry back in the day. Hang on, Jason, just one sec. Is there was a great ad and it was a small little boutique brand. Ali, you'll like this. It was a little boutique brand. And their ads were these three Cuban dudes, these three, I guess they were brothers or two brothers and a cousin or some shit. And they were doing crazy shit, like jumping in a pool together. And they were, the ad would be like these three Cuban guys, like jumping, lunging their bodies. To, and the ad would always read like this. Three Cubans can't be wrong. And I always would scratch, scratch my head and go like, I guess that's probably true. So three slogans, you can't go wrong. Think about that. You're in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, I love that, man. Uh, you know, JD, thank, thanks for jumping on, brother. You I know, love you guys. Uh, got to jump. I got Jason from Artnet here. I, I got you, man. I got you. Uh, you, JD. you know, Joy, Jim, uh, good to see you. Allie. You too, JD. Last love, Joe. Talk to you later. Yeah. So, uh, you know, listen, um, man, we've, we, we've had an amazing show tonight so far. So I hope everyone's got their ask Frankie drinks or ask Ali drinks or ask Jimmy drinks, <laughs> Joey drinks, Charlie drinks. I, I don't care who you got, man, but you know, uh, we've had a, an amazing show and we're talking about, uh, Nelson's Greenbrier distillery, Tennessee whiskey, Bell Mead bourbon, we're talking about our Undercrown 10 um, and just the amazingness of what those products are and the stories, man. At the end of the day, it's the stories. Frank, so, we're talking about retro hailing. And it's, to me, as important to do it with bourbon as it is cigars. Oh, yes. When you take a drink of bourbon down and you retro hail while you're, you're swallowing it, it does two things. One, it kills the burn. So if you drink a bourbon, and I, I, you'll notice I, I don't necessarily mix my bourbon. It's just straight from the bottle of the glass. But if you find that burn of the after effect, try breathing out your nose while you're swallowing the, the drink down because oh, it'll yeah. cut that totally. Yep. Um, right. And you get a whole different set of flavors when you retrohale it too. When you let that, that right. you know, flavor go out. And retrohale is such, a, such an important part, right? You know, when we talk about Kentucky Chew, right, what we're really talking about is getting the whiskey in all parts of your mouth, you know, because, you know, there's a misconception that the taste buds only exist on your tongue. And the reality is taste buds exist on your gums, side of your cheeks, upper part of your palate, into the back of your throat, into your nasal cavity. So the idea of a, of a Kentucky Chew is really just to get the, uh, the fluid, right, into all parts. And that little bit of air that goes out that blows off the extra alcohol is part of what gets you tasting some of those finite, and they are very sublime flavors that exist in the whiskey. Um, but you want to get the alcohol out first. And in the same way, when you're having a cigar is, you know, uh, many, many of you guys, please have a cold draw on that cigar yeah. before you get started. Just get it as you, as you want. Here, take this one. Yeah, there's uh, some degenerates on this on the stage here. Okay, uh, Jack's it's okay. getting jealous, huh? <laughs> yeah, it, it it is what it is, man. I, I gotta do what I gotta do. Uh, you know, so yeah, give me that one back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, but but part of it is uh, is take that cold draw, you know, because we're so busy with our lives and we just want to get to lighten that cigar, but take the cold draw. And get those flavors on your palate first, you know, before you even get to puffing that uh, that beautiful uh, ring that Allie does. 
Yeah, uh, that's a you talent know, right there. Yes, absolutely. Get get those get those flavors. Now I'm a I'm a huge cold draw guy, right? Get those flavors in, and sit on them for just a minute uh, before you go ahead and light that cigar. Yeah, it's part of the process of slowing it all down. Slow your whole experience yeah. down, and it's so much more enjoyable. I think right. that's and, what I, I fell in love with on cigars was the fact that it's the only time in my day that I would slow down. You know, you can't race through it. You, you're forced to slow down, relax, talk to your friends, talk to people in the lounge you're at, and really get get to enjoy it. Um, well, that's it. I mean, they did early studies. Uh, I think the cigarette companies probably did it in the 40s or 50s of why you smoke. Why do people smoke? And the number one answer, the number one answer was because they like to watch the smoke. And in, and in that, in that watching the smoke as you're smoking, you, you get lost in it. You, there's a calming nature to it. Uh, mesmerizing. And, and you slow down, it's mesmerizing and you can get, and you get lost in it. And that's your moment of solitude and clarity. You just let everything else just go, poof, everything else is gone. Well, that's right. It's very meditative. You know, there's, there's people that'll stare at a candle to meditate because it focuses their attention on that in some way, shape or form, but you're, you're right. That is actually, when I think about it, I, I smoke for many reasons. Yeah, just get in there, Joey. Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> <it> a little. <laughs> what a, what a douche. Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> let's continue. <laughs> At my side. Thinking about, right, that meditative nature of the thing, but the reasons we smoke, you know, everybody in, in Facebook landia that's watching us, that's going to be on YouTube watching this later, just think about why you smoke. Is it because you want to want to calm down, give yourself an hour, sit with your friends, which we have been missing for the last year and a half, to be able to sit with people and just and think about what's going on in your life? Like, why do you smoke? I think that that's kind of an important question. I smoke for the aroma, and it makes me look cool. I'm kidding. But it has almost an incense effect when you're when you're just sitting there and, and watching the smoke waft in the air and you're you're smelling the tobaccos and um, I think a lot of people don't sit and take the time to do that to enjoy what the smoke smells like from the kind of through the nasal passageway. Um, yeah, you talk it, about yeah, it's it's definitely more about that than analyzing what flavor notes you're getting every eighth of an inch of the cigar. It's really <laughs> it's the experience of the whole thing that really ultimately matters yeah when people ask me what i taste i tell them I, you know for me and it's similar to bourbon i can tell you if i like it or don't like it what it makes me feel but i, I you know burnt cheerios melted strawberry jam over freshly burnt like i don't get those things yeah. i'm never going to pretend to get those things we we have uh, our cigar advisor team when we're in the office we have a whiteboard and we write all the weird you know flavors down that we see in reviews from various people over the course of each month and it's it's kind of fun um well speaking of weird tasting notes it's that time it is that time uh, of the night where we go to mescal minute with joey drew and it's just a minute it's just a minute but it won't be mescal because i'm actually doing mescal tonight on cigar dojo immediately following this whole thing here fuck those guys yo uh yeah. listen Man, uh right. <laughs> you have a major commitment to this show and i'm here so uh so give me the fucking mezcal give it's me the pouring front. rain over my head we <laughs> here? yeah we we gotta <laughs> cut this shit joey let's go bro what i'm gonna give you is not the mezcal. i'm gonna give you the ricea That's oh it, wait a second there you go. I'm giving you the Ricea because with an Undercrown 10, not only does you who pair amazing with it, which it does, everybody knows that now, is that Ricea and this one specifically. So where Undercrown 10 is that Mexican hot chocolate, this is like a sour New York cheesecake. You know, that's what this Ooh. tastes like. And it's so delicious. You will not believe it. And that goes perfect with the Undercrown 10. It's just like this yin and yang of amazing flavor, the sweet, the spicy, the semi-sour. It's yummy. And so Ricea, it's not a Moscow, maybe, kind of, sort of, but it's an agave distilled spirit. Look for that. Sounds like a, a vomit I had uh, after being at the 
ice cream shop. Uh, so uh, <laughs> thank you, Joey, for that. That was quite amazing. And I have uh, a remember everybody, I'm gonna I'm gonna go into ask Frankie Drinks. So wait, uh, wait, wait. if you win, make sure you email prizes at drewestate.com. So uh, I got Habibi Hishi Hashi uh, ask Ali Dranks if you were ever to accept a proposition by way of rang, what finger would you wear it on? Uh, I have huh. no idea what this question is, uh, but yeah. Ali, please answer away. Pinky's out. <laughs> answer is Panky. <laughs> Panky's out. So, uh, Habibi, uh, answer is Panky's out. Uh, that's that's how we roll. So, uh, next up, Donna Collette. Uh, he, she asked, "Ask her any drinks. Do you find yourself uh, more often pairing cigars with drinks, or the other way around?" And the reality is I'm probably going your way. I'm going with a cigar to kind of know what its body, its, its, uh, its nuances are and knowing um, what spirits are more inclined to, to pair with that. So um, that's how I usually go. So it's I'll start with the stick and then go with the sip. So, uh, Next up, Brian Massey, congratulations. Ask Frankie Drinks, will you ever do an episode just on making infused simple syrups? No, motherfucker. Come on, man. You know, you think I got that fucking amount of time? Come on, man. You know, you make some syrup, you throw some shit in it, you let it steep, and then you roll, right? That's how we got. What's but uh, if you really want to know, uh, we'll hook you up, man. Congratulations, Brian. <laughs> uh enjoy your uh swag pack uh i'm just kidding man i'm just kidding um but making serves is a a finite science um and you usually just go look one to one if you use you know a couple ounces of sugar use a couple ounces of water um and then in that mixture um go ahead and steep your your ingredients so if you're using ginger a couple slices of ginger like we did tonight if we're doing honey um cut that with water and that's what we got going so uh there's a lot uh, to do with with uh with syrup so brian massey great question uh Rissard, miss erica biglow uh asked frankie drinks what do you like to drink while smoking your undercrown 10 Oh, or to drink while you're smoking on your crown 10, I'm going to say I'm loving my Bell Mead right now. Bell Mead bourbon, that's a money drink. So uh, so jump on that. It's a Tennessee bourbon, so you're going to love it. And, and Enjoy. And make sure you get the yoo And a yoo because that's my boy Joey. And you just say, home. if you got your chance to get a, a Mexican hot chocolate and it, you saw Freestyle Live and you saw my, my special cocktails that night, uh, jump on one of those. Frankie, uh, continue. I got to ask, if you were going to make a cocktail out of you who what else would be in it? Um, I would say probably 151 Bacardi and Regret. Uh, so, uh, that would be part of it. Wait, what's the ratio? Uh, one and a half of 151, two ounces of this thing. Well shaken with, uh, with a, a couple of dashes of, of pain and suffering. Uh, so. Uh, not creme de menthe. <laughs> By the way, creme de menthe would be an, an incredible addition to that. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, uh, listen, uh, I one quick shout out to Donna because you picked on her question. She was part of that last that uh, trip, safari trip we were talking about beforehand. <laughs> She's part of the send in Chuck Norris crew. So uh, thanks for oh, the question, Donna. Awesome. So uh, listen, uh, Mark Anthony Esco Escobar, you know, not uh, the other Mark Anthony. 
never had a sour mash. How does it compare to regular whiskey? Um, man, the difference is hard to tell. Sour mash is a process where they're taking some of the, the, the yeast from distillation, the uh, fermentation process of the previous batch. They're saving it. It's kind of like making sourdough bread and they're making it into the next, uh, into the next batch. Um, that's really the root of what sour mash is. It's the continuity of, of the yeast mother into the next whiskey. Um, and it keeps that, whisk, that keeps that yeast alive. It keeps it going. Um, but the reality is what, you, what you're trying to get, you know, for you guys that have had uh, Jack Daniels or Nelson's Greenbrier or another Tennessee whiskey is you're getting this process that looks identical to bourbon, but it takes one step extra. It goes through uh, a charcoal filtering before it goes in the barrel. And that, that process itself keeps it, keeps it from being called bourbon. And now it, it becomes an endemic spirit called Tennessee whiskey. So uh, that's it. Uh, congratulations, I, Mark Anthony. Is that it? Are we done? All right. Well, so I would, can I add one quick thing? Man, last for, words, brother. You know, man, uh, I didn't give you done. enough of fucking platform to so talk good. because, you know, I, you are freaking master. Of I was going to say is if, if people haven't tried bourbon or whiskey and they're kind of scared because they hear these horror stories about 130 proof, try a Tennessee whiskey. That mellowing process takes all the burn out of it. So whether it's the Nelson's Greenbrier, Jack Number no. Seven, whatever it is, Gentleman Jack, it'll it'll it's like for me the way acid was my introduction into cigars. This is the introduction Tennessee whiskey into into bourbon and whiskey. Well, thank you, my man. Thank you so much. Uh, Joey, my man, uh, thank you, Juan. I know you've got to jump on a new, uh, you know, a new thing because uh, you, you're becoming your own, uh, you know, person in the, uh, in, in the virtual world. And I'm going to say, uh, as always, man, thank you for being on. Oh, man, thanks, sir. Always love to be here. Love to see everybody in the chat group firing it up. And, and Allie, always love to see Allie. And good to see Jim. Can't wait to see everybody in person. I'm tired of looking at these goddamn screens. Let's get together. Let's do this. I can't wait to get back to Florida and see you guys. Dang. All right, Frankie, pull it out, and then you can go to the bathroom. So, uh, and last but not least, uh, because, hey, guys, check it out. My ears are dead. Uh, I can't hear any of you. Uh, so I'm right, going to assume that when your lips show. start moving, you <laughs> stop talking. <laughs> so, uh, Ali, uh, I'm always honored by you, uh, by your beauty, by your knowledge, and by your geekiness. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's what I love most. Geekiness first. Good luck and prosper. All right. So, yeah. Is that it? So, cause I can't hear it. This is it. All right. So, uh, listen, next week we got, uh, you know, we got Larson Ignis, Aqua Ignis Cognac. So all you guys wondering about Cognac, we got your pairing and, uh, Jack, bro, you, you kind of like screwed me up, man. My ears are dead. I got nothing, uh, but love you guys. Cheers. Good riddance.